All right, so today we are reviewing proteins, uh, probably something you covered in biology, depending on how much detail your biology course went into, and uh, obviously how long ago you had biology. But we're talking about proteins this week. And so let's just make sure we differentiate between a protein versus a polypeptide. Right, the main difference here is size and also function. We'll talk about function of proteins later on. All right, we call proteins macromolecules. They're really, really big, right? Large macromolecules. Last week when we were drawing, you know, DNA, mRNA, protein, I called it a protein, right? But it really wasn't a protein. You wouldn't be drawing a protein. You don't have that kind of time, right? You were drawing polypeptides. Okay? So just make sure you know the difference. A protein is a humongous macromolecule. We're not talking about some teeny tiny little four sequence a four base sequence, right? That, that would be a polypeptide. And so this is a figure from your textbook of many roles of proteins, right? So structural proteins, like collagen and keratin, um, contractile proteins, in other words, they're in, they're in muscles, transport proteins like hemoglobin, uh, lipoproteins, we already talked about them, right? Storage proteins like casein, Hormone proteins like insulin and growth hormones. Enzymes are proteins that carry out reactions, right? The ASE ending, we've seen that already. That's a, a giveaway of what it's um, used to catalyze. And then protection proteins like immunoglobulins. So we're going to be looking at a lot of these in greater detail, but not today. Right? Today we're just looking at the structure of proteins, how they form, all that good stuff. So this is what I just said about the different classes, and we'll look at these classes in a greater detail in a separate lecture. But today, let's get out our handout that I gave you last week. We want to review, we want to review our amino acids, right? Because proteins are made from amino acids. And again, if you've lost this, just go to the course website and download it. You can also do an internet search to say, you know, 20 standard amino acids and you'll get a hundred different results of the amino acids. We want to make sure that we are really good at identifying the types of intermolecular forces in each of the amino acids because those IMFs drive protein formation in terms of um, the structure. So at the top of your handout, this section right here, well, yours is unlabeled, right? These one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These top nine, those are all nonpolar. How do we know that these are all nonpolar? Well, let's look at the R group, right? Because this is the same in all of them. So we're looking at the R group. Just a hydrogen, just a methyl group. Look, that's nonpolar, nonpolar. These are all hydrocarbon chains, right? Even though right there is a little bit of polarity, the rest of this, what's the primary intermolecular force here? Nonpolar, right? Nonpolar. Again, there's a weak dipole there, but again, the rest of this is nonpolar and nonpolar. So, nonpolar means they're only capable of London forces, right? And they're hydrophobic. Phobic meaning loving or fearing? I'm fearing. Fearing, right? So, anything that's nonpolar is going to be hydrophobic. So, make sure you label on your handout. Hydrophobic, right? Hydrophobic means they don't want anything to do with polar molecules. They don't want anything to do with water, right? So they're gonna, when these proteins fold, right, you're gonna be looking at these R groups to determine what kind of interaction is gonna occur. <laughs> if these two are next door to each other, hey, that's great. They can kind of fold into each other, right? So that the R groups that are similar can be near to each other. If this is next door to something extremely polar, right, they're going to fold away from each other. So just be able to identify hydrophobic, i.e. nonpolar, right? Those are only capable of London forces. Now these ones are polar. So if you look in the next row, that's the serine row, serine, threonine, tyrosine, cysteine, asparagine, glutamine. Those guys are all polar. They're capable of hydrogen bonding. Let's talk about where, right? In serine, it's got the OH, 
that's capable of hydrogen bonding. So if you were writing on your, if you were writing on your handout, which I would recommend, right here's where the hydrogen bonding's occurring. On three and E, there's where the hydrogen bonding's occurring. Hydrogen bonding. Now these are all hydrogen bonding. This one is a SH, which is that hydrogen bonding? It's dipole dipole, right? And there's also something special about cysteine. This one forms sulfide bridges, which we talked about very, very briefly when we were talking about thiols. And I'll show you more examples of this today. And let's say you've got a protein that's curving like that. And there's a SH sticking out and a SH sticking out. Those two can form a sulfide bridge, which would make a loop in that protein. If you've got two sulfides near each other, my uh, marker's kind of fat, so it's hard to draw. There we go, that looks better. Right, when you've got two cysteines sticking out, they can make little loops in proteins. That's called a sulfide bridge. That's something special about cysteine that you should definitely know. All right, we've got here, where's the hydrogen bonding coming from? And these two, asparagine and glutamine. All right, there's your hydrogen bonding. And also the carbonyl is capable of hydrogen bonding too, right? A carbonyl will be capable, if there's something over here that's capable of hydrogen bonding. So this could go either way. It could, it could go like dipole-dipole, or, or it could go like hydrogen bonding. It depends on what's on the other side. But these guys definitely have hydrogen bonding. The amines, absolutely 100%. So all of those are hydrogen bonding, with the exception of cysteine. Cysteine's dipole-dipole, but you need to know, when two cysteines are near each other, they form a sulfide bridge, okay? And that can make loops in proteins and that sort of thing. And you'll see examples of this. I'll show you several examples later on. Hmm. All right. And then the last group at the bottom, that last row, are your acidic and basic amino acids. So what's making them acidic? What's making them basic? Well, ascorbic acid and glutamic acid, aside from the fact that their names contain acid, right? What functional group is this? CO2 minus, that's a, what kind of acid? Right, that's a carboxylic acid, right? And then what functional group would this be? Those are all amines, right? Okay, so those can behave like acids and bases, and when they're near each other, they'll actually form um, an acid base link. We'll see in the examples we'll go through. Okay, so are we good at identifying the IMFs? of the amino acids based on looking at the R groups. What's the overriding influence? Um, you just look at the R group, right? Is it nonpolar? In other words, London forces only. Is it hydrogen bonding? Um, is it acid base? What's going on? So there are four levels of protein structure. Like I said, I don't know if this is something you did in biology or not. It depends on how much detail your biology course went into. Primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And we've actually already used this notation before, right? When we were talking about primary alcohols, for instance, or secondary alcohols. We've actually used that notation already. Primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. Or levels, 
that we're going to look at the structure of proteins. And we're just looking at the structure today. We'll deal with function in an entirely separate um, lecture. So primary structure is just the sequence. Okay, it's literally just the, this list, right? If I give you a list, all right, this is the primary structure. It's literally just a list. My primary structure is not functional. Okay, it's not functional. If you sequence DNA, right? A, G, U, A, G, T, C, A, G, T, whatever, right? That's just the list. It's just the list, right? Primary structure is the same thing. It's literally just the list of amino acids that are in the protein. That's it. Okay, so if I give you this picture and I ask you, which level of protein structure is this, and it's just a linear list, you know yeah, it's got to be primary structure. Okay, because primary structure is boring. It's just a linear chain. Remember last week or two weeks ago, I can't remember now, when we were drawing, um, we were doing trans transcription and translation, and those figures showed a linear chain coming off as it was being synthesized. Right, that's primary structure. It's just a chain. Um, and so there can be major changes in primary, there can be major differences um, that come from primary structure changes, right? So these are two, and this is called a nona peptide, these are not proteins, right? These are two pro nona peptides, oxytocin, vasopressin. They only differ in these two spots in their primary structure, right? But overall, <laughs> those are very different. Those are very different functional um, roles, right? One's involved in childbirth and contractions and all kinds of stuff, breastfeeding. The other one's involved in kidney function, but they only differ in their primary structure in two spots. Now, we don't call these proteins, we call them normal peptides. A protein's a macromolecule. And there's the primary structure of insulin. Again, um, just showing primary structure, right? It's just two. When you're looking at primary structure, you're just looking at the linear chain. Okay, just looking at the linear chain. Now, secondary structure is when the primary structure folds into substructures. This results from hydrogen bonding, and not all regions have a secondary structure. That's really important. Okay, it's localized, meaning it's in little pockets. Okay, so the entire protein, if you're looking at the entire protein, there might be a little pocket here that's got a secondary structure, and a little pocket over here that might have a secondary structure. A little pocket over here. So what do I need to know? I need to know that it's regularly repeating, and I'm gonna show you there are three types of secondary structures. I'll show you them in just a second. It comes from hydrogen bonding, and that it's localized, meaning it's in little pockets. So there might be a little pocket over here, a little pocket over here, a little pocket over here. So these are substructures, and there are three that we're gonna look at. Okay, the three types are alpha helix, beta sheet, and triple helix. We're gonna look at pictures of each one. Alpha helix, beta sheet, and triple helix. So alpha helix has a coil shape. It looks like a corkscrew. Right, so if you were trying to sketch an alpha helix, most common, okay. right, alpha helix would just look like a corkscrew. Okay, and again, the entire protein would not necessarily have an alpha helix. So you could have, you know, irregular, 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 right? Only this region right here and this region right here would be alpha helices, okay? That's what I mean by localized. It's just little pockets, okay? So that would be alpha helix. So there are some better pictures than mine, right? What's stabilizing it? Hydrogen bonding between the NH 
and the carbonyl. Remember I told you the carbonyl can go either way, right? It can act like a hydrogen bond source if there's something capable of hydrogen bonding next door. So it's just coiling around. And then there's what it will look like from the top. R, all the R groups are sticking out, okay? It's coiling and the R groups are all sticking out. So if you're looking down the top, that's what it would look like. Does this make sense? So here's an example of alpha helix in hair, right? So there's alpha helix subunits, which is part of a bigger unit, which is part of a bigger unit, part of these cells inside your hair. All right, beta sheets, beta pleated sheets are flat. They look kind of like an accordion. So if you take a piece of paper, let's find something that's not important. There we go. All right, if you make, probably did this when you were a kid. I know I did. Out on the playground on a hot day and you want to make yourself a fan. Right, did you ever do this? Ah, oh, so hot, right? That was like a beta sheet. It looks kind of like an accordion. Right, so from the side, like I've got that accordion shape. Your R groups are sticking up and below the sheet. So they're kind of flat. They got that accordion kind of shape to them. So there's a picture of beta sheet. There's the hydrogen bonds that stabilize, right? And then imagine all these R groups coming up towards you. So this one's coming up towards you, up towards you. This one's behind the board, that one's behind the board, that one's behind. So behind, 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 above, 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 behind, 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 above, 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 right? So they're sticking up and going behind. So here's what it would look like if you're looking at it from the side. Right, so if you're looking at it from the side, you see R groups sticking up, and then you'd see R groups sticking down below. And then they can be oriented two ways. They can be going anti-parallel, or they can be going the same direction. So if you ever see a big giant arrow, that's representing a beta sheet. Okay, it's a lot easier than drawing out this accordion. So if you ever see an arrow, that's what that's representing. So let's put in a blank, add to our little drawing here. So if these are all alpha helices, right? That's alpha helix. And then that's alpha helix. Remember, the whole entire protein doesn't have necessarily. Let's add a beta sheet here. So a beta sheet drawn in accordion is kind of hard to do, which is a lie. A lot of times textbooks will just represent it as like an arrow, right? But just know that it's kind of this accordion looking thing. Right, there would be a beta sheet. Okay, the whole protein doesn't have beta sheet, just that local area, just that local area. And as you know, I'm no artist, so <laughs> I'm not gonna expect you to do works of art either. Now the triple helix is when you have three alpha helices woven together. So obviously these are gonna be structurally really strong, right? These are gonna be things like collagen has a lot of triple helices in it. All right, so if, if the red one's a triple helix, and the blue one's a triple helix, and the green one's a triple helix, right, you're just weaving three alpha, uh, excuse me, if all three of these are alpha helices, you're just weaving three alpha helices together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can think of it like they're braided together, yeah. And each one of these is an alpha helix, right, so you take three corkscrews and you braid them together. And braid is a nice way to think of it. Right, so if we're looking at this one, where are the um, secondary structures and what secondary structure do you see? 
There's only one secondary structure in this. What is it? Uh, alpha. alpha helix, right? And it would only be right here and right here and a little tiny bit of one right here, right? The rest of the protein doesn't have anything. So that's what I keep trying to emphasize is that it's just localized to little pockets, right? The rest of it can be irregular, and that's okay. Now the tertiary structure, this is where a protein has a functional 3D shape that can do something, it's meaningful, okay? So the R groups start interacting with each other, and this is what gives your protein a biological function. It's now functional, okay? Once you hit tertiary structure, now we say that our protein has some biological function. And again, it's coming from R group interactions. So this is where it's really important that we're able to talk about the R groups, right? Hydrophobic, hydrogen bonding, right? All that good stuff is what's giving tertiary structure its existence. So here are the interactions that, these are the primary interactions that give us tertiary structure. Those sulfide bridges, which are also known as disulfides. And sulfide bridges occur between, I'll just write on the screen. Get rid of my sad pathetic drawing here. Sulfide bridges occur between what? Well, which amino acid? Right. All right, so if you have SH near another SH, right, that would give you, and now those two are linked. So here's blah, 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 here's blah, blah, blah. Now they're, they're linked together. All right, salt ridges. So these are your acid base. So this occurs. acid base okay so for instance look at your handout and give me an example of an acid and a base that could form a salt bridge lysine and arginine lysine and where's no because those are two bases oh. okay then Glutamic acid and lysine. Glutamic acid and lysine. Yeah, that would work. That would be an acid. That would be a salt bridge. Yeah. All right. What's going to give me hydrogen bonds? This occurs between amino acids with OH or NH, right? And there are a lot of options there. What's an example of two things that could give me hydrogen bonding? Yep, that would work. And then hydrophilic, hydrophobic. So hydrophobic would be two what? Two nonpolars. And they could be folding into each other, right? Um, or it could also be a nonpolar repelling or repelled by a polar, right? That would work too. And then for hydrophilic, what would that be? That would be two polar molecules, and there are lots to choose from there. Or again, it could be a polar repelling or repelled by nonpolar. It could go either way. All right, so two polars could fold in near each other, or a polar could pull, fold away from a nonpolar, right? Oil and water kind of thing. Two nonpolars could fold in toward each other. 
or they could fold away from each other to get away from each other, like an oil and water kind of thing. Make sense? And again, driving force here is the R group interactions. Tertiary structure is maintained by R group interactions. So this is a summary from your textbook of hydrophobic, hydrophilic, salt bridges, hydrogen bonds, disulfides. So here's a picture showing some tertiary structure. Right, so here would be an example of a salt bridge. Right, there's an amine, there's a carboxyl, so that would be a salt bridge. Here's hydrogen bonding in OH, NH. Right, so there's the hydrogen bond. OH, OH, there's a hydrogen bond. There are two sulfides, so that's a sulfide bridge. Here are two phenyl groups, as R groups, so those are folding in toward each other. Right, these are nonpolar, they're folding in towards each other. Make sense? And here's another picture. I think this one's a little bit better. Right, there's sulfide bridges. These would be hydrophobic, these would be hydrophobic. If this is aqueous out here, right, this part's folding out so that the OH can be near the water if it's water out here. Hydrogen bonding, OH, you could also call this what? That's acid, that's base. So you call that salt bridge. There's salt bridge too. Make sense? Okay, so an example of a tertiary structure would be in myoglobin. Okay. Myoglobin is involved in transporting and storing oxygen in muscles. Myoglobin is very similar to hemoglobin um, in that hemoglobin has four subunits, whereas myoglobin is just one subunit. So I'll show you hemoglobin in a second. Now, not all proteins have quaternary structure. Some proteins get to tertiary and they stop. And here's an example of one that doesn't have anything beyond tertiary structure because it's just not big enough, okay? If your molecule, I mean, if your protein is functional, remember, it's not functional until you hit tertiary structure. If your protein just isn't all that big, then all you're going to have is primary, secondary, tertiary. Myoglobin only has primary, secondary, tertiary because it's just not that big. Right? There's another picture of tertiary structure. Ion dipole, hydrogen bonding, salt bridge, sulfide bridge. So look at your handout and decide what kind of tertiary interaction these two will have. I'll pause the video and let you think about which ones you want to get. Okay, let's go through each one of these. Leucine and valine. What are we going to get with those two? Let's draw the R group. So if we're looking at our handouts, valine has Right? That's what that R group looks like. And leucine is CH2CH. So what is this going to be? Hydrophobic, right? They fold in toward each other. They'd be near each other, right? Two cysteines. What's the R group of cysteine? So if those two are near each other, well, there's something special about cysteine. When two cysteines are near each other, what are they for? Sulfide bridge, right? And don't be surprised if you see in some textbooks they call that a disulfide. Okay, it's the same thing. All right, aspartic acid. What does the R group look like there? 
Mm-hmm. And then lysine, what's that one? All right, that would be acid base. You could also call it salt bridge. Either one will work. All right, what's serine look like? And three anine? Oops, I drew it sticking up the wrong way. There we go. That'll be hydrogen bonding. Yep, right here and right there. Feeling okay on how we would figure out ones like that? Good. All right, now quaternary structure is when two or more tertiary subunits come together. And like I said, not all proteins are gonna have quaternary structure. It's only gonna be your large, large, large complex proteins that'll have this. For smaller proteins, once they get to tertiary structure, they're done, right? If you're a small protein, if you're limited by the number of amino acids you have, you get to tertiary structure, you're biologically functional. So if you don't have any more than that, that's okay. Right? It's okay to only have tertiary structure. Because if you're just not a humongous protein, right? You know, that's like saying all cars have wheels, but not all cars have 18 wheels, right? My car doesn't have 18 wheels, it's functional with four. So just because you have tertiary structure doesn't guarantee you're gonna have quaternary structure. You would only have quaternary structure if you are a really, really big protein, okay? Your smaller proteins aren't going to have that. And it's going to be stabilized by R group interactions as well. So a nice example is comparing myoglobin to hemoglobin, right? There's myoglobin. It's one subunit, and its job is transporting oxygen inside muscles, whereas hemoglobin... Hemoglobin has four subunits, so there's one, two, three, four, and it's transporting oxygen through the blood. Right, so hemoglobin, you could think of as like four times bigger than myoglobin, because in, sense, in essence it is, right? Myoglobin would be just this, basically, because myoglobin's got this center in the middle. We'll talk about the heme group um, when we talk about function. Today we're just talking about structure, right? Four subunits coming together, that's what's giving me a quaternary structure. Not all proteins have quaternary structure. If you're a smaller protein, you just have tertiary and you're done, and that's fine. But if you're a big, big, big protein, right, then you would have a quaternary structure, and hemoglobin is a good example of that. And so this is a figure from your textbook, just summarizing all the structural levels. Right, so primary is literally just the sequence. There's nothing functional about the primary structure. You're just literally listing all the amino acids, glycine, leucine, cysteine, etc. Secondary is those three substructures, right? They're localized, that's the key word, and they result from hydrogen bonding. That's key information too. Tertiary is when what? R groups start interacting with each other. So if two R groups on two alpha helices interact with each other, that pull those two alpha helices near each other. Okay? And then quaternary would be when you've got two or more. So let's, let's highlight the key words. Let's highlight the key words to differentiate here between our levels of structure. Right, so primary is just the sequence. Right, it's just the sequence. Secondary, and I want to add the word 
and it is localized. Right, it's in small regions only. Alpha helix, beta sheet, triple helix. Right, that's a key word. Stabilized by hydrogen bonding, and it is localized. Okay, those are our key words for secondary structure. Tertiary, you get your three dimensional shape and it's stabilized by R groups. Okay, oops, interactions between R groups. And your book left off something here. This is when we have biological activity, right? You're biologically functional once you hit tertiary structure. And then this is when you've got protein subunits. And then also add to quaternary, not all proteins have quaternary. Like I said, all cars have wheels, but not all cars have 18 wheels, right? You don't need to have quaternary structure if you are a smaller protein, right? If you're a smaller protein, once you hit tertiary structure, you're functional, you're off to the races, you're good to go. If you're a bigger protein, you'll have quaternary structure, right? So tertiary, everybody's gotta get to tertiary. To be functional, you gotta make it to tertiary. Tertiary only, in smaller proteins, whereas quaternary structures in larger. Smaller proteins do not have quaternary. Larger proteins do. All right, so a good example here, myoglobin. versus hemoglobin, right? Both carry oxygen, one carries it in the muscle, one carries it in the blood, right? Myoglobin is one subunit, whereas hemoglobin is four subunits. Do we see how to differentiate between the four levels of structure and what holds them in, in place. And this figure's from your textbook. I just added some information to it. All right, so there's a picture of primary. It's just the sequence. This is one example of secondary, but is this the only secondary structure that exists? No, this is alpha helix, right? But there are two other secondary structures. There's beta sheet, and there's triple helix. This would be tertiary structure, which could lead to quaternary structure, but not necessarily. Okay, tertiary structure doesn't guarantee you have quaternary structure. And so there's another example, primary, secondary, tertiary, and then quaternary. Okay, so I'm gonna pause the recording we're gonna do a little bit of matching here. Match the description to the level of structure. All right, let's do some matching here. We're matching the description to the word. Oops, you can erase the board afterwards. Okay, so beta sheet, is that primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary? That would be secondary. Order of amino acids. What's that, primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary? 
That's primary, right? That's just the sequence. A protein with two or more subunits. That's quaternary. The shape of a globular protein. Keyword you might want to add in here is 3D shape. Tertiary, tertiary right? You get tertiary, you get three-dimensional shape when you get tertiary. And then if you have disulfides or sulfide bridges, at what level is that going to occur? Secondary stabilized by hydrogen bonding. It'd be at tertiary and it'd also be at and quaternary as well. Because right, quaternary is stabilized by the same thing that tertiary is. All right. There's only one last thing to discuss. Structure is directly related to function. Right, so just like when you take anatomy, I mean, I never had to take anatomy because I'm a chemist, but I would assume that that's something you talk about in anatomy, right? Your function is result of your structure, right? Your arm works as an arm because it's built like an arm and not like a leg. I didn't really ever get into that stuff, but it works for proteins though too, right? Because the structure of a protein determines what that protein can do. So we're gonna talk about function in another separate lecture. And one of the things, the last thing I wanted to mention is hydrolysis, okay? When you hydrolyze a protein, you're gonna break up the peptide bonds, you're gonna get smaller peptides, which you can degrade all the way down to the amino acid level if you wanted to. And when you digest proteins, that's what you're doing, you're hydrolyzing proteins. Um, so if you need to break down a protein, right, you need some amino acids, that's one of the ways that you do that. And again, we'll talk about this when we do function. Today was strictly structure. Any questions on levels of protein structure, all that good stuff? All right, that's where we're going to stop.